Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today to attend this talk about time efficient aircraft fall isolation procedure with NLP techniques. I am very happy to be here. I am the head of health management and predictive analytics in Airbus DS. And the reason because I am very happy to be here is because sometimes I have the feeling that people consider that, okay, Airbus, Airbus is a big player, but it's not a very innovative company. Okay, you are a very big manufacturing industry, but you are not an innovative company. And I want to share with you today that really we are an innovative company and we are in fact one of the most or the biggest players in artificial intelligence in Spain. I wait two minutes. Okay, so I was talking about health management. Okay, and what is health management? Health management is manage an aircraft health status, now, diagnosis, and in the future, prognosis. It's like a doctor for a human. Exactly the same, we take care about our aircraft in the same way that a doctor take care about their patients. So this is so important because health of an aircraft you can consider is a very, very critical thing. But what is health management today? It's a little bit different because what we are doing today is self-manage the aircraft health status, mainly driven by, by an artificial intelligence. And this is why I'm talking, we are a very innovative company. In fact, in our team in Getafe here, we have more than 50 people working on that. And this is one of the key strategies of Arbas, to use data and to use artificial intelligence to improve aircraft safety, health management, and other incredible tasks that we are performing there. But with a specific example, what is health management? Why so important? Obviously, you can consider if you fail with your health management, you have an aircraft crash. In fact, you can see with health management, we monitor, for example, the engine's condition in order to avoid a rotor bust. That is a very critical situation on aircraft, as you can imagine. But it's not only that because health management is one of the key contributors to the mission system. Why? Because in a defense environment, the mission is the key thing. We need to perform our mission in the right time and in the right way. And health management is providing the information about health status of the different system in order the mission system can take decision about what is the right action to do. But on the other hand, maintenance is a very workloaded task for a person. For example, a fuel system that is located inside of the wing of the aircraft. In order to perform a maintenance task, what do you need to do? You need to unfill all the fuel tank. You need to put vents in order to remove all toxic vapors. And after that, somebody needs to be inside the technician, inside of the wing, and to perform the maintenance stack in a very uncomfortable situation because they need to be like that. So for that is very important health management. And the last point obviously, something very important in every company, in every industry, is the cost. Maintenance cost is the key driver for total cost of ownership of an aircraft. And this is something crazy when you are thinking an aircraft development is costing more than 20 billion for euros and maintenance cost is even more. So for that, in the maintenance strategy that we are using in Arbas, similar to another industries, we have started with reactive. Fix something when it's broken. 
no, it's seen not very good strategy for an aircraft because if you wait until that moment, maybe you have nothing to fix. So for that, we develop a very powerful scheduled maintenance plan. It's called preventive maintenance when we define based on theoretical models based on predicted operational use of the aircraft, some specific maintenance checks in order to perform an inspection, a review, a repair, or a removal. But it's the same case. It's not accurate enough because the operational of the aircraft is not the same as you predicted. And sometimes you perform the action before it needed or later. And you can have, or you go back to reactive maintenance because you have the failure before it was predicted theoretically, or later, so you are increasing the maintenance cost. For that, we go to the proactive maintenance. This is more or less the state of the art in the most of the industry. Even all the people are talking about predictive maintenance. What is proactive maintenance? OK, we are taking data from the system, and we are trying to eliminate or remove defects, calculating the abnormal behavior or detecting anomalies. It is a much better approach but it's not always the best because the same way. Something that is behaving abnormal, it could not fail. And you are wasting money. And sometimes the degradation are so quick that you cannot predict using an anomaly detector. For that, in the hype right now, what we have is predictive maintenance. Everybody talks about predictive maintenance, and it's very, very important in an aircraft. Because obviously, if you predict something before it happens, it is good for an aircraft in order to increase safety. For predictive maintenance, what we are understanding is to use advanced analytics and the data from the sensor of the aircraft in order to predict maintenance events, or to predict failures, or to predict everything. And this is a much more intelligent strategy. But I have told you that we are innovative in Airbus. So what we are looking for in the future is a prescriptive maintenance strategy. And this strategy is an artificial intelligence based health management system that is capable to diagnose or prognose something before they happen. But not only. It's a system that is capable to recommend you your maintenance action. It's the Alexa of the maintenance. You ask something, and the system is capable to recommend exactly what you need to do. And even more, in the future, the system will be completely automated. And will be on board on the aircraft, and your aircraft will, take, will make its own decisions and will provide to the operational system the health status in order this operational system can modify its control law, adapt to the new situation, or even to go for a safe mode. For that, it's very, very critical in the aerospace industry to go for that. But the question is, do we need artificial intelligence to do that? Or we are lead by the hype about artificial intelligence. OK, we are going to put artificial intelligence in everything. And the response is yes. We need artificial intelligence in order to really have a good health management system. Okay. If we want to have this benefit, increased fleet availability, this is the number of hours regarding all the time that the aircraft is available to do something. If we want to reduce maintenance cost, or if we get our mission success and all under the same word, safety first, we need to have a health management, a driving system. In order to detail that, I was inspired by for some talk that I was attending past year in MATLAB Expo, it's called, Are You Ready for Predictive Maintenance? And I have taken that as an example 
about why it's needed artificial intelligence in health management and in maintenance area. If we want to build a health model, we can go for the traditional approach. Engineering driving, we call that. We take old knowledge from the engineering guys, the models, the design data, manuals, whatever they have, and we combine with the data, with the real data, and we try to get some outputs. But it doesn't work the most of the time because the systems are very complex. An aircraft is a very large, complex system. And there is no engineer around the world that really can predict every interaction of an aircraft system. It's impossible. For example, the fuel system, taking as an example, has interaction with the engines, with the electrical system, with the environmental system. The operation of the aircraft is not always as predicted because the user doesn't that, does not use the aircraft always in the same way. And it is impossible to perform a theoretical model that is capable to detect or predict failures. So, okay, so we're there for data driving approach and we use machine learning and artificial intelligence or whatever techniques that is data based in order to do that. So we get the real data, we level the output, the behavior, and we train an algorithm in order to get a model. But here's the problem. An aircraft is a very large, complex machine. So for example, an aircraft could have, has some of our aircraft could have 600,000 signals with rate up to kilohertz. We are generating terabytes of data per fly in a fleet w with 100 aircraft or 1,000 aircraft. It's something crazy. The state of the art of the AI technology, machine learning technology, is not capable right now to get this data and to develop really accurate models. For that, in Airbus, what we are doing right now is combining the both of wor both worlds. The best of both worlds. It's called hybrid. We take the engineering knowledge, engineering models, the theoretical knowledge, we take the real data, and we level the outputs. And using machine learning, we train models against the engineering models. And we are capable to provide accurate algorithms. Because in order to use an algorithm in an aircraft, we need to perform trusted AI. We need to be capable to explain to the authority how our artificial intelligence is working. If not, it's not possible to certify. And we need to be capable, really certify that if we want to use. For example, in predictive maintenance, authority are requesting at least 99% of accuracy in order to certify a predictive maintenance system. And this is something that we cannot get right now with the state of the art of AI technology only. Probably you have listened about digital twin because what I was talking about was digital twin. Digital twin is when I have a digital model of every part of the aircraft. We use real data to fit that model, and so using machine learning, artificial intelligence, we can predict or detect something. And this is the state of the art. And for that, it's so important artificial intelligence combined with physical digital models in order to get health management. In context of this talk that we are presenting today, I am going to put an example with the fuel system. Fuel system is a very critical system because it's contributing to several catastrophic conditions, fuel ex uh, extarvation, fuel exhaust, or tank explosion. Any of these situations lead to a loss of an aircraft. It's one of the key maintenance contributors in terms of cost. And I have talked about the cost of the maintenance of on an aircraft. And it's one of the three principal contributors to the aircraft availability. Due to this main point, it's very 
hard work to perform maintenance on the fuel system, and it's a very critical system. So you think, okay, it's a problem, but when the aircraft is landed, for example, you want to perform the fault isolation in order to get the root cause analysis in order to replace some component that is faulty. Okay, the aircraft is landed, you have all the data, you analyze, you look for the entry, okay, I need to perform that maintenance action. Okay, it takes time, but you can fix that. Run is not so easy because an aircraft is a very large complex system and when, when the aircraft is landed, there is no fault code. We have hundreds of, of fault code. So the technician needs to go code for code performing the maintenance action until he, he gets the right problem. And this is what we are solving here with NLP techniques using machine learning together with engineering knowledge. Much, much better than me for explaining that. Welcome, Rocío, to the stage, and please. Thank you, Miguel, and thank you to all of you to be here. I am very grateful for the opportunity, and I'm really excited. I'm going to talk to you about the root cause analysis problem, uh, the part of data analytics problem. So, uh, the problem here is to identify the father of the all four codes that are uh, that the uh, the technician have when the when the they have the post flight report. I then I will explain you a little bit the terms that we are going to use. Um, with all of this, a traditional approach was to use what is called expert knowledge. That means uh, that you have the knowledge and the experience of seasoned experts that have a deep understanding of the system. Um, then with the expansion of the use of algorithms, uh, they, they try to make an effort to do algorithms in order to art automate this root cause analysis and also to make independent of individuals. Um, the solution uh, was pretty poor because at, uh, finally it was like kind of uh, algorithms hard-coded. So as you might be thinking, this is not uh, a solution because if you, you cannot hard-code all an aircraft because it's a very large complex system. And also if you hard-code all the systems, the output of the algorithm would only be valid for that specific aircraft in that specific configuration. So in an industry as aerospace, where companies have a lot of uh, a great variety of products is not a solution. Then with the digitalization and the machine, uh, well, the industry 4.0, we get available more data related with the physical properties of the systems and also of the status of the system. So it was easier for us to use machine learning techniques and probabilistic models to, to do these kind of things. So now, uh, before explaining you the, the technical solutions, I want to introduce you a little bit in the, the, the kind of data that we are working with. The first I want you to know is what is a fault code. Well, I want you to know that when an air, a failure occurs in a flight, it is registered. So when a system has uh, some status that meets with, with certain predefined conditions, then an error message is triggered. This error message is what is a fault code. It's only an alphanumeric uh, code to identify a failure. So a fault code is a failure. That's all, okay? Another thing that I want you to know is that each fault code has its own uh, aircraft fault isolation uh, document. That is a document where it is explained to the technicians uh, how to identify which is the real equipment that is failing and how to solve this problem. Okay, so in the in the AFI task, what we would see is all the equipments that can affect to that failure. Okay, um, another thing is that all the equipments are identified uh, uh, with a nomenclature that is called FIN, fu functional identification number. Okay, and FIN only means equipment. Okay, another term is uh, that when you make a flight. 
you land on ground, and then you have a report with all the full codes that have happened during this fl flight. Okay, so in this is what it called post flight report. In the post flight report, you have all the failures triggered during the flight. So it's like a list of codes. So once we have seen um, the kind of data that we are working with, we're going to see what is the amount of data that we have. So for solving this uh, problem, we had a 1,504 possible fault codes for a field system. This is all the fault codes that can happen. This is the theoretical ones, okay? And then we have uh, the half of the of AFI procedure documents. Why is the half? Because an aircraft is symmetric. You have uh, half of the fuel system in one wing and the other in the other wing. So to solve a problem with a sensor in the right wing is the same procedure for the left wing, okay? So that's that is why this number is the half of the other. We have studied uh, data for 14 different aircraft during several years, and we have a total of uh, more or less uh, 4,000 of post-flight reports. And in these post-flight reports, what we saw is that we only had 404 full codes of the 1,500 possible full codes. So the first approach that we took was to use a probabilistic method, the Bayesian network. These kind of algorithms, what they, they aim to, to determine a parent-side relationships between a set of data by learning a direct acyclical graph, okay? This is done by calculating the conditional probabilities of a node to be the father of, of a children. So for that problem, we use the post-flight report, if you remember, the list of full codes of all the flights. So our input data were, as you see in the screen, a matrix with ones and zeros. One if the full code happened in that flight, and zero if not. So that was our, our input matrix. And then uh, we built the, the network. Once we had the network, we also had to do a planning because there were a lot of relationships that uh, had a really low value of the conditional probability. So we are not interested in this case, so we, we set a prune. And we only take, take took as valid uh, relationship the ones, those ones that have more than an 80% of conditional probability. So we had uh, the network built, but sadly we saw that uh, this approach was not good enough. Why? Well, uh, we saw that some relationships uh, were physically impossible because they had no interface between uh, the two equipment, so it was impossible to have an impact between each other. So that's a pain point in the probabilistic methods that you are not taking into account the knowledge of the engineering part. It's only the data. Uh, another thing was that the data is biased because we use the data from the post-flight report from six years. So we have, as I told you, four, 400 of full codes, but there can be a lot of more. So if you have a new full code in the next flight and, and you don't have it on your graph, you won't know what is the impact of that full code. Okay. Now, another important uh, problem was that the real big failures that can cause you an accident, thanks God, uh, do not happen too much time. So the conditional probability would be really low and it would not pass the threshold of the planning. So you won't see also the impact and, and that's really dangerous. That is why we thought, why don't we use all the knowledge that we have at Airbus Company in order to make the root cause analysis? Because probabilistic one is not enough. Well, uh, that is why we introduced the knowledge, uh, the automated knowledge graph approach. The first time that the knowledge graph was introduced was by Google when they tried to improve the indexing of the webs and they used uh, two techniques the name entity recogn recognition mixed with the theory, theory of graphs. So our approach is basically the same. We are going to index all the equipments of our aircraft and then we're going to build the graph with the graph theory. So how are we going to learn this relationship between the equipments? And that's the key point. We are going to use the AFI tasks to know how the, how the equipments relate to each other. Why? 
Well, the, the AFI tasks are beaten by expert people of the system. It's the people that actually designed the system. So they, they perfectly know how the system behaves, how the things relate each other. So I think it's the right place to look for. So we, we will use natural language processing to extract the knowledge for the AFI task. And with that knowledge, we will build the graph in order to point out to the, to the root cause. So the first step is the natural language processing. I want you to know that it's very complex to extract the information because the AFI tasks are written in English free text. So it's very difficult to extract the knowledge. Another thing is that uh, it has a lot of nomenclature related with our space field. So there is no standard library that is strong enough for your, for your algorithms. So we have to do it uh, by ourselves. The, the good point is that the AFI tasks are very uh, structured. They have uh, the paragraphs itemized, and in each paragraph you have uh, the equipment that is the candidate to be the default and how to relate to each other. Also, it is ordered by importance. So as you can see in the slide, the first uh, equipment that would appear, for example, would be a computer, then a wiring, and then a sensor. Because if you have a sensor fail, it does not make sense that the computer is also failed. But if the computer is failed, all the connections make sense that you have lost it. And how do we build the graph? Well, we have a... We have a list of all the possible uh, equipments of the fuel system. So we search for them for all the 700 tasks. Uh, we were looking for the, for the equipments. And then we applied some regular expressions to, to find how they relate each other. For example, if the task tell you, please first look at the first uh, the equipment number one, then look at the equipment number two, and then look at the equipment number three then you will have three nodes in a row, okay? But if the AFI task, please check equipment number four, and then the possible equipments failed are the, the two, the three, or the four. Then you have one parent and three children of the same parent. So that kind of expressions uh, were the, the ones that we used to, to develop the algorithm. Once we had uh, the NLP, done. Uh, we had like a dictionary with the parents and his children. And then we only had to apply graph theory to, to connect all of them. So as I have told you, we have used the AFI task. That's an, a theoretical graph. We have used all the possibilities. So how can we take into account the real operational data? Well, uh, once we have the graph done, that is the the line that you can see right here, then we use the post-flight report to see which are the real failures that you have in a flight. With that failures, you see which are the equipments that can cause that failure, and then you extract from the theoretical graph your nodes and your edges that are affected. Here you can see the result. Uh, the graph knowledge is right there. Uh, it's all the systems that, that can contribute to the field systems are right here. So these are all the equipments of the field system. Uh, it makes sense, the results, because as you can see in the, in the center part, you have uh, the system that is in charge of the communication of all the equipment. So if you lose that system, you lose everything. Then in the, uh, in the top, you see uh, the probes, okay, the probes are sensors that are monitoring the quantity of fuel in the system. So it makes sense that they are in the tip because they should not affect to another to the computer thing, for example. And uh, in the middle is uh, the wiring that is called harness, that is which connects this probe to the communication system. So as you can see, it makes sense that in the center is the computer, in the middle the, the wiring, and in the tip is uh, the, um, the sensor. Um, that's the theoretical one, okay? If we wanted to, to see for a specific flight, we would have to take a post-flight report and extract the node. And that's what we have uh, on the left. 
uh, we have the PFR graph. So uh, when the technician is going to, to make the maintenance, it makes sense that he start on the middle because it's more related. It, it do not make sense that he starts on the tip of the graph. So what is the advantages of, the, of using this algorithm? Well, the first and most important is that we are taking the knowledge of Airbus people, of engineering people, of expert people of, of the company, but making automated and without human intervention. So uh, another uh, uh, benefit is that it makes sense, as you have seen, the structure of the graphs has sense from the engineering point of view. Also, it's deterministic, it's not probabilistic. So it's, it's a great advantage. And also, uh, it does not need to retrain. Okay, you have this uh, theoretical graph for each aircraft only by changing the AFI task that apply to each other. So uh, you would not need to retrain. Another thing is that we did like a study of what was the, the maintenance workload that we were reducing with these, te these techniques. And we discovered that it was like a 30%. So we were really contributing to, to the maintenance tasks. The only limitations that I saw to this algorithm is the, the natural language processing, because as I told you before, there is no library for our space industry. So as it is written in free text, uh, there are some expressions that the algorithm is not able to detect. So uh, a few of the edges of the graph did not make sense because these kind of particularities. But the rest, uh, I think that is a good approach to use artificial intelligence with the knowledge of the company. And Miguel, if you want to close the talk. Okay, so only I want to say thank you to all of you. And obviously, if you are interested to learn more about what we are doing in our vast related artificial intelligence, machine learning, or whatever, please contact me by the application or later in the in the meeting. And again, thank you so much to be attending. Thank you.